This is Floss Weekly. I am Doc Searles, and this week, Aaron Newcomb and I are talking with Clyde Siepersad of the Linux Foundation about training and open source hiring trends. This is a really gigantic topic. It has to do with how we learn open source or relearn open source across a zillion categories where GitHub alone is beyond all comprehension and getting people up to speed, hiring, diversity, all of it, it's on the table and that's coming up next. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 643, recorded Wednesday, August 18th, 2021, Open Source Hiring Trends. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat discussing tech topics big, small, and strange. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello again, and good morning, good evening, and or good whenever it is, wherever you are in the world. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week I am joined by the great Aaron Newcomb, wherever he is in in front of his green screen. (laughs) We were talking green screens earlier on our back channel. So so how and where are you, dude? Yeah, yeah, I'm at home, of course. It's it's still COVID. (laughs) So uh, yeah, I'm not not going anywhere anytime soon. I know you're traveling with to some uh, secluded locations uh, uh, very safely, but uh, yeah, I can't go into work. I mean, well, I guess I could technically, but nobody's going into work and stuff. So yeah, I'm just stuck at home thinking about doing some stuff. That's it's pretty cool. I'm gonna in a little bit on my channel actually. I'll give you a preview. I'm gonna be working on. Oh, you can't see it. I gotta hold it in front of me. There it is. Um, yeah. You know this little. Uh, three dollar microcontroller with some added components is able to actually emulate the IBM PC, which turned forty this week. Oh my gosh! Um, and uh, is, yeah, so I'm that is be integration on that. right there. Wow! Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Can you believe three dollar a three dollar microcontroller? And when the IBM oh PC came out in 1981, it was what like uh, about three thousand dollars, I think. And if you wanted the a hard drive and the upgrades, it was even more. Oh yeah, no, the, the, it was all backplane. How many how many slots were in the backplane? Uh, there were I think it was eight. eight or something. You had your you know your micro to mainframe interface card. You had a hard drive card. You had your Ethernet card. You had a bunch Floppy of drive card, and, yeah, yeah, and they all cost serial know, card, yeah, yeah. like you know, serial later oh, right, serial and parallel all the, got internet, yeah, yeah. that yeah. all got integrated all, later. All, but in the beginning, you needed yeah everything. Yeah. I, I worked for Hitachi Semiconductor during the time that they were dealing with the fact that everything they made was gradually being taken out of the PC and put into Intel's board or whatever it was that yep. you know Intel was just integrating more and more of it. So that makes yep. complete sense. And and you're in California, someplace I assume. Oh yeah, yeah. Not too. I'm in yeah. the Bay Area, so not very far yeah. from the studio. About an hour from the studio, actually. I am in my new temporary for the next year home in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Go Hoosiers! <laughs> I'm even wearing a reddish <laughs> shirt, not the correct crimson. It's more of a a pink. But um, uh, <laughs> I'm in the in the basement of this house, which I just realized a minute ago is going to be a very bad place to be if the air conditioner comes on because it's down oh, here. Oh, no. <laughs> so hopefully my wife got, got the note and she'll make sure it's off. Anyhow, um, uh, so our, our guest this week is uh, Clyde Seepersad of the Linux Foundation. Have you Are you familiar with what he's up to in advance of us jumping on the, on I, the, on the show? I, yeah, it's, yeah, so I did a little bit of background research. This is a topic that I'm... Um, I think I think a lot of especially tech companies these days are really interested in right. So yeah. you know, in terms of hiring, diversity, um, those kinds of things, it's a real struggle. And you know, from a historical perspective, you know, you look back that the original computers weren't technical at all. They were mostly women calculating numbers, um, and yeah. we've come a long way from there, where it's actually pretty difficult to 
to find uh, women sometimes as software engineers. So yeah, I'm kind of curious what they're what they're up to, what they're doing to help correct those issues. Yeah, especially as you noted earlier that when the temperature says it's COVID outside, um, that affects hiring. <laughs> you know, who's mm-hmm. willing to work at home or not? You know, my my uh, my younger son who is in the hiring business actually is at an offsite right now. I guess they now have offsites where they allow you to be there, but not virtually talking about all these topics, among other things. So we'll get into that. But first, I have to let you all know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat, discussing tech topics, big, small, and strange. Compiler comes to you from the makers of Command Line Heroes and another of our sponsors, and is hosted by Angela Andrews and Brent Simino. Technology can be big, bold, bizarre, and complicated. Compiler unravels industry topics, trends, and the things you've always wanted to know about tech through interviews with people who know it best. On their show, you'll hear a chorus of perspectives from the diverse communities behind the code. Compiler brings together a curious team of red hatters to tackle big questions in tech like, what is technical debt? What are tech hiring managers actually looking for? And do you have to know how to code to get started in open source? The first episode covers a topic of much debate in the tech world. Should managers code? Jumping in to fix the problem can be very seductive. In this episode of Compiler, you'll hear from a manager who has learned that supporting his team to fix the problem rather than doing it himself might be slower, but it can lead to better results. A managerial position is seen as a milestone of working life. Suddenly, a person who worked on code begins to step back from those day-to-day tasks. What does that mean? What started as an internal email from Red Hat blossomed into a much deeper discussion about career growth and what can get caught in its wake. Have you ever walked into an interview and been asked to work through a coding problem on a whiteboard? If you were hired, how much of your time do you actually spend in front of a whiteboard on a job? In How Do You Interview for a Technical Position, Red Hatters cast a skeptical eye toward the dreaded whiteboard interview, but discover that it can have some real technical benefits. You know, I I checked the first episode out of Should Managers Code, and here's the cool thing. I found it very relevant to the topic of our show today. The first episode just dropped on August 5th, so you can go download it at any time. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'll also include a link on this episode's show page. Thanks to Compiler for their support. So I want to welcome to the show Clyde uh, uh, Seepersad. Um, his, I, don't, I normally don't read down through um, uh, a, a whole... Um, uh, a whole, um, let me find it now. There it is, <laughs> a whole bio. But this one is so impressive. So I'm just going to read through it. He's responsible for the training and certification arms of the Linux Foundation, which provides high quality training and skills development to the open source community, among many, many other things. Over the past decade, Clyde has held senior leadership positions in the education space, most recently, most recently as head of operations at 360training.com, and before that as a senior executive of uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Prior to his involvement in education, Clyde was a principal at the Boston Consulting Group, and he started his career in the public sector working within the Ministry of Finance in Trinidad and Tobago. He holds an MBA and a master's in economics from Oxford University, where he was also a Rhodes Scholar. So welcome, Clyde, to the show. <laughs> there he is. Thanks, Doc. Happy and to I, be here. And I, and I want to point out that his his background there is is actually a green screen with a brick wall he can actually lift up like as if he had superpowers. So that's really cool. That's right. I'll, 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 I'll do my superpower demonstration later in the show. <laughs> so so okay. So you're at the Linux Foundation now, and um, what brought you there? You know, other than that you got through the interview, <laughs> what brought you to the Linux Foundation rather than those other really cool jobs that you've held? Yeah, it was interesting because initially it was set up as a 30-minute coffee. And I thought, oh, I'm I'm in Austin, Texas. And uh, it's a bigger tech town now than it was 10 years ago. But uh, I thought, well, you know, it'd be good to meet other folks. And it's interesting to talk to some nonprofit folks. And I remember the 30-minute coffee turned into a a two-and-a-half-hour discussion and I came home that night and told my wife, hey, I had coffee with a guy today. I think I might quit my job. Uh, and uh, it was really because 
it opened my eyes so quickly to the scale of the challenge as well as the opportunity uh, of how do you get talent into the open source space when open source software is really sort of eating the world. And when you don't have these big monolithic companies with their go-to-market machines cranking out training, sponsoring labs at you know computer science undergrad programs, uh, when really what you have is uh, people downloading you know GitHub repos and then and then trying it out and hopping on IRC channels, and having spent a decade in online education, seeing that mismatch between the adoption of the technology and the availability of talent to use the technology seemed like a really interesting and compelling and important challenge to take on. And uh, and you know, that was the trigger that got me involved. And it's been amazing watching this unfold over the past seven or eight years, because the story has only become more true, especially as we've moved into this age of microservices and cloud adoption. Uh, open source technologies really are at the core of almost everything you see happening in computing, whether it's blockchain, whether it's 5G, whether it's IoT, whether it's Kubernetes. Uh, so endlessly fascinating uh, being here, working on developing technology talent uh, for this ever increasing array of really super relevant open source projects. I've noticed that there's a actually a, a, a high demand right now. I mean, everyone's working remotely. Um, it seems like I, I know we're we're kind of in a hiring spring at Sysdig, the company that I work for, um, and it's difficult to find people these days. It seems like even despite COVID, things are really uh, uh, it's a, you know it's a it's a good market for people looking for jobs. Do you find that to be true? Is this just a seasonal you know bump, or is there still issues that need to be worked out? It is definitely true. Um, it's interesting. I remember years ago hearing people express concern that with the deployment of um, CI CD systems and the ability to auto scale on the cloud, that the need for technical talent might go down. And in fact, the opposite has been true. The need for technical mm -hmm. talent has gone up because the old cliche is so true. Every business is now a technology business including my favorite local Chinese restaurant uh, out of the uh, highway intersection here, which used to write their orders, tickets in Mandarin by hand and pass them back to the kitchen, which because of the pandemic had to stand up a website with web ordering. And so even Zhe Shui is now an internet business <laughs> where she's processing orders <laughs> on the internet and feeding them to her kitchen. And uh, you know, if any of you knows anybody who's had Kubernetes on their LinkedIn resume, you know that they just get carpet bombed with inquiries. And it's because there isn't enough talent. There's a massive backlog of legacy applications that need to be made into microservices so they can be deployed to the web. And more and more companies are sort of realizing that that is the future of, of computing. Uh, but if you look, for instance, at computer science degrees, they're still using their curriculum from 10 years ago because that is what is accredited. And so our pipeline of technical talent is a fundamental mismatch between what's in those programs and what is out there in the real world. And that's why you know, we continue to see this uh, mismatch between the availability of technical skills and the demand for technical skills. And that's really the nexus where we try to operate and do our part to sort of figuring out how do we get technical skills into the hands of the biggest, most diverse audience on a global scale, because the adoption of these technologies really is global. Um, and then how do we get those people in front of employers and give the employers the confidence to speak to them, engage with them, and potentially hire them? I'm so glad you mentioned the the learning gap because my son just got through his CS degree at Cornell um, and just started his first job uh, Monday, actually, out, you know, outside of school and stuff. And, uh, you know, I remember his sophomore year, maybe junior year, I can't remember, I said, so... You know what do you what are you learning? Are you learning about DevOps? Are you learning what DevOps is and how to operate in a DevOps environment? Because it seems like that would be a crucial skill to learn um, going forward. Are you are you working on open source projects? You know, and basically the answer was no. You know, they were they, they the courses were interesting, but to my mind it was like, well, 
you know, shouldn't you be learning about, you know, setting up a Kubernetes cluster or setting up Prometheus or, you know, skills that actually are going to come in handy? Of course, you have to know how to code. But I mean, you know, it was just a little frustrating to me living in the modern world myself. Like, wow, I would if I if I had your background, but I saw that you were an expert in Kubernetes or or whatever, that would make you so much more hireable for me, you know. Um, why do you think that gap is still there? And and are you doing anything at the Linux Foundation to help uh, educators start to to bring some of these more modern uh, skill sets into their curriculum? Yeah, I do feel for them. And, and full disclosure, my, my wife is an engineering professor. And so I totally get the constraints in which these folks operate, right? You're in a university system, you have an accreditation body that is sort of life or death for your program. And it's very difficult to change those curriculums. And so over the years, I've spoken to at least a half a dozen deans or chairs of computer science programs. And, and they've all said the same thing, which is, look, we recognize that we're unable to cover the basis on some of these things, even for basic things like using GitHub. But we need to teach the things that are in the curriculum that are in the accredited curriculum. And nobody has an interest in doing a five-year degree. And so when you get squeezed in this box of you know, four-year degree programs, mandatory programs, as you say, really good and interesting courses around computer science that, is, that are important, but then what gets left out is all the new and emerging stuff. And uh, everybody's frustrated, including the deans of computer science programs and the inability to sort of get that last mile piece going. Uh, and what, one of our contributions has been to say, hey, let's get curriculum out there that introduces people to these concepts and let's make it free and let's put it out on um, licenses that allow people to reuse it because there's no such thing as too much training. There's no such thing as too much exposure. And we've seen that when you do that, you do reach large audiences. So for example, we have an introduction to Linux course that's free that we run on edX, edX.org, which is one of the big platforms for college type courses. Mm -hmm. And you know that's well past a million people enrolled in it over the past five or six years. And that just, I think, illustrates for us, it's from 200 countries. The majority of it is outside North America. You know, there's this sort of big global hunger for this, and it's running up against the mismatch with the formal education system. And frankly, it's also running up against, you know, more and more you're seeing these announcements and stories about companies that are no longer even requiring degree programs as part of their hiring process. And so the switch to uh, just-in-time learning, the switch to here are the technologies, you know, you're showing one course there, on open source development and Git, you know, if you graduate and you don't know what Git is and you haven't used it, it's it's going to be a steep learning curve when you step into the real world. Um, and so I think our view has been, let's understand that there are constraints in the formal education system and let's try to figure out how can we make programs available that complement what those folks are doing and make it possible for those uh, folks who are pursuing degrees like your son to parallel track it and be able to develop some of this experience in parallel to the formal degree programs because once you hit once you hit the cold phase of what's being used in the real world, you're gonna to have to know it, right? And so the sooner you start working on it, the better. Right, right. Well it's great that you're trying to bridge that gap for sure. Um uh, because I think it's really necessary at this point, if you want to get a good job, like I said, to have those skills. Um, I did want to ask you one other question. I guess this is asking your opinion, um, but you know, we talked about formal education. What, do you, what are your thoughts on boot camps, though, and uh, you know, programming boot camps and, and quick programs to get people up and running? I know uh, at a former employer, we used to hire a lot of people from boot camps because they came with those DevOps type skills that uh, a, a person coming out of a more formal education setting did not come with. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Oh, I love seeing good quality bootcamp programs. I think they've really filled a huge gap in the market for people who need something less than a full degree program. I think one of the challenges with it has been who is the target audience and who can afford it? And so, a lot of the boot camps that have been quite successful have also been quite expensive. And so folks are paying 10, 15, $20,000 for 
and for having a very hands-on and good quality experience, but that isn't necessarily hitting the mass market. Uh, and so I think the challenge is how do you scale? How do you scale education when the mismatch between the demand for talent and the availability ta of talent is really large? Uh, and part of that is figuring out how do you use technology? How do you use the internet? And how can you take a bootcamp experience and really make it accessible to a global, diverse audience? And uh, that's something that we do try to do. We actually created a bootcamp program last year, and it's up on the screen now. Heavily self-paced, supplemented by live daily instructor sessions. You know, there's a mentor that works with folks to try to make sure that they don't go weeks and weeks without logging in. And uh, I don't know that we fully solved it, but but we are trying to solve this issue of how do you create a good quality bootcamp where you can enroll regardless of which time zone you live in, which country you live in and develop those core sets of skills and have it at the end be able to demonstrate that you have those skills. Because I think that's what employers value from boot camps is when mm -hmm. somebody takes up and they have hands-on demonstrable skills, that makes all the difference in the world. Because the difference between, hey, I have a great feed that's pushing me interesting articles on Kubernetes and hey, and I can secure and scale up a cluster, that's the difference between getting the job and getting the interview. I have maybe two questions in one, and um, one of them is um, about the the overall population, the sort of what the talent pool is. And I started on this topic with Linux Journal in 1994, which is actually four years before the term open source was used. Um, and in those days, and even into the aughts, maybe even well into the aughts uh, in this millennium, um, most of the people working in open source were self-taught because they were dealing with something that wasn't necessarily taught in school and they were scratching their own itches and they were coming up with a lot of the code that we're now using is sort of the, 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 al the alpha codes that are, that are in everybody's life. And even in the case of Git, uh, which you mentioned earlier, um, Linus Torvalds invented that when he, <laughs> when he needed it. So he lightning struck twice in that case, but in that case, it wasn't even a professional need. It was kind of like, I just, I just need a, a better way to do this than BitKeeper, which is what he's using up to that, that point. So where I'm going with this is that there was a, a talent pool early on that was mostly self-taught. And, and I'm wondering where the place, and this is my, sort of my second question, my second point that could be a question is, um, where does that talent pool go now? Uh, where people are kind of still teaching themselves up to coming up with new kinds of code but there is in the world now such a large abundance of companies that have a crying need for open source developers because they're using open source code of many, many kinds. So there's this, there's this big attraction that large companies have in hiring. People already know stuff, but there's also still this imperative to invent your own stuff at the same time and to be self-taught and not even learn it at a boot camp. You're just busy teaching yourself at home or with your friends. And so I'm looking for a way to sort of reconcile those two imperatives, the corporate need on the one hand for talent that's already qualified and the inventive need on the part of individuals to do creative stuff like they always did. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great observation, Doc. The, I think there really, our perspective is there really are two different audiences here. There's the audience of folks who have the right um, aptitudes to be able to get in and truly teach themselves something. And for those folks, you know, you hear this, uh, I, somebody, but back when we used to have conferences before COVID, uh, I was chatting with someone and they said, you know, uh, GitHub patches are the new resume uh, because that's what people mm -hmm. can see and instantly believe, wow, okay. Might have been an obscure topic, but you got a patch submitted and it went up the food chain and got merged in. That's great. Uh, that pool will always be there, folks who are self-motivated. I think the big challenge that we have seen is that may only be 10 or 15% of the potential population. The, the big pool of folks, uh, for instance, if you're coming from an underprivileged background in a, in a city, you might not know anybody who's ever done this type of career and you may not really have been exposed to it. And so if you're on the outside looking in, it's 
it can be very daunting to try to figure out, hey, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to teach it to myself. And so I think figuring out how do you bring the folks who don't have that set of aptitudes to jump in and do it themselves and, you know, hop on the IRC channels and hop on, you know, the Reddit threads and figure it out and interact with people. Um, you have to keep both audiences in mind. They're, they're, they're quite different audiences. And the that initial smaller audience of the folks, you know, the, the future leanesses of the worlds, uh, they have a much entry guide path and entry path into these types of careers. And they're the ones who are going to have their own, you know, hobby projects in GitHub, and they're going to be looking to, to uh, contribute patches to projects that they're using. Uh, that's great, but that's not a large enough audience. And so uh, part of the challenge that we try to address is, you know, for the you know for every one of those folks, there's eight or nine folks who don't have the background, the experience, the confidence, frankly, to jump in and try to do this on their own. How do we get them on ramps into this? Because if you get folks in and they get build their confidence and they build their awareness, at some point they flip into that other audience and they have the confidence to be able to go in and submit patches and work with others and collaborate. But the uh, the barrier to entry can seem a little high. And so a lot of what we have been trying to focus on is how do we get more people over the hump to the point where they can be self-sustaining? And a lot and that really has to do with making the programs accessible, making them affordable, making them high quality, vendor neutral, and uh, allowing people to feel comfortable stepping into this. Yeah, I, I keep thinking back to that famous, I think it was a New Yorker cartoon back in the late 90s, uh, you know, two dogs in an apartment and, and one is telling the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, well, one of the beauties of the internet is you can step into training programs and start participating and start learning. And it doesn't matter if you're a underrepresented group or not, right? You're just, everybody else, you're just your user handle. And so I think finding ways to reduce those barriers to entry, whether they're real or perceived, is a really important part of tr truly tapping into the full availability of talent that's out there um, so, that, so that we don't end up in a situation where the lack of talent becomes an anchor that is pulling back on the adoption on um, deployment of these technologies. So I was just reading the the chat and there's some good discussion there. Um, you know, if you're listening or watching and and don't uh, don't know, we have a live chat. I think most of our viewers know that, but definitely jump in there and ask questions as we're as we're going through this. Um, you can see from the from the chat there was a couple of comments I just wanted to bring up. So Phoenix Warp brought up that he. Uh, he says he started his master, master's program and they did have a Kubernetes Docker course, uh, but it wasn't very extensive. So that's good, at least because, you know, it, granted, I, I think that should be part of a, a, ba a bachelor's course, not necessarily a master's course, but at least it's there. At least there's progress uh, being made. So that's really good. And then a couple other people have put out uh, basically chiming in along with what you and Doc were saying just now in terms of there always seems to be a self-learned component to this where, uh, you know, people that are getting hired these days are coming in with a mixture of both formal education and self-taught uh, abilities that they've demonstrated through, like, as you were saying, through GitHub, et cetera. So really good discussion in the chat room. Um, I did want to change the topic maybe just a little bit and talk about the the thing that I was interested in at the beginning, which is diversity. And I'm just curious, like, what is the Linux Foundation doing to encourage diversity? How is it overcoming some of the diversity challenges uh, between men and women in the in the workplace? I know that certainly my followers are uh, on my my YouTube channel, which is technical, are 99.5 percent male. Um, if I think about the people that are working in our uh, engineering group, they are uh, probably 90 plus percent male. So how do we get more diversity in engineering groups? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's one we think about every day. Uh, I would say there are two main thrusts that we've invested in to address this. The first is, is pretty obvious, which is we try to do a lot of scholarship programs and provide free training and certification to under historically underrepresented groups uh, on a global basis. Uh, so, for instance, we used to run an annual scholarship program uh, that gave out 20 to 30 scholarships a year. 
uh, starting last year, we wrapped that up to 500. So we've got you know 500 scholarships that we're trying to give out for developers, for admins, for engineers. And then like you're showing on the screen now, we also partner with organizations that work in these areas. So this recent one with Women Who Code, um, trying to be a matchmaker, right? Prov work with organizations that have connections to these audiences and then making the training and certification programs available at no cost to them. So we're continually doing that. Uh, we're constantly on the lookout for organizations that work with, with underrepresented communities and trying to figure out how can we uh, get our materials into that program to help people along with uh, speed along their journey to technical competence. So there's, there's a scholarship thing, which and I think most organizations will try to do things along that dimension, right? To make programs available to those harder to reach communities. The other track, the second track for us has been putting content out and making it available for free. Uh, we use uh, edX a lot for this. So it's edX.org, if folks are not familiar. There are uh, platform that started off with Harvard and MIT, I think, providing college courses. And that has been really a revelation for us to see the data over time. So I mentioned earlier that we have an introduction to Linux course that's well over 1 million people enrolled. 27% of those people identify as, as women, which doesn't sound like a, maybe a great number, but to your point, Aaron, it, 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 it's better than 6%. Um, Getting those materials out there, you know, there's another one on screen now about SBOM, which of course has been a very hot topic recently with the executive order in the US. Getting free material out there that people can take in a structured fashion and not have to go into a classroom, not have to go to a meetup, or you know, uh, has become a really great way for us to get folks to take that first step and dip a toe into the water. And so the you know, we're always adding new content. We're always looking for new channels to make people aware that these resources exist. But uh, it's been interesting to see the extent to which a free self-paced program online can get people over the hump of starting, just saying, hey, I, I think I want to learn this. I'm not sure I want to go to my local community college and be the only African-American, female, you know, whatever underrepresented group um, that you happen to be in, in that classroom. But if I'm taking it online and, and people know me as a user handle, that feels less, uh, like less of a hurdle. Um, and so those have been the two big pushes for us is trying to work with organizations on scholarships and then trying to provide these free self-paced online programs that are globally available and working with our marketing teams to increase the awareness of those programs and the availability of those programs. And we have seen a tremendous amount of success there. Uh, people do get, you know, it, it's a, uh, you, you only need to get them far enough in to where they unlock their own passion and then they take off on their own journeys and they discover what it is they you know, get excited about. Is it front-end development? Is it coding? Is it back-end? Is it scaling up infrastructure? Uh, but finding these pathways to get them introduced to the material in a way that is convenient and affordable and uh, does not seem as, um, as threatening if you're an outsider group definitely has has it's been a learning for us is just how effective that is in helping to draw new talent pools into the open source ecosystem. We have a bunch more so I got questions. We're looking at the, the back channel here and, uh, and one notice that you've got lots and lots of great information on your page. So that's a good thing. But first I have to let you know this episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and is trusted by millions. Empower your employees to follow password management best practices. With Bitwarden, you can securely store credentials across personal and business worlds. Every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault. Use Bitwarden for your business. It's fully customizable. Adjust features using enterprise policies to adapt to your business needs. Use Bitwarden Send, a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether text or files, directly to anyone. 
Team members can generate unique and secure passwords for every site. You'll get enterprise-grade security and their GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and SOC 2 compliant. Their end-to-end encrypted vault helps mitigate phishing attacks by storing passwords and more. Now you can do even more with the Bitwarden Enterprise plan. Some of their new features include admin password reset. Enterprise organizations can enroll in admin password reset and allow designated administrators to reset forgotten user passwords. Master password reprompt. Use the new master password reprompt option to require verification of your master password to view sensitive vault items as designated by the user. Interested in a business plan? Bitwarden has plans that will work for you. Their Teams organization option is $3 a month per user, where you can share private data securely with your coworkers, department, or entire organization. For enterprises, use Bitwarden's Enterprise Organization Plan for just $5 a month per user. Their free organization plan includes two users who can store and share secure passwords. Bitwarden believes that everyone should have access to basic password security tools. Individuals can use their basic free account forever for an unlimited number of passwords or upgrade any time to their premium account for less than $1 a month. And if you're looking for secure password storage for your entire family, their family organization option gives up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Using Bitwarden Cloud, You can get started in no time. Monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using the Bitwarden Vault Health Reports. Identify exposed, reused, weak, or potentially compromised passwords, as well as any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan at bitwarden.com slash twit, or try it for free across devices as an individual user. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. All right, so I've got a question. How does uh, um, your work that that um, uh, the Linux Foundation is doing, I mean, I, 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 I think that the educational purpose is is great, uh, but also is, is there money to be made here? I mean, I... I I don't want to sound insulting, but I mean, there's got to be some sort of uh, way to keep the program sustainable, right? There is. And uh, it tends to come in the form of our certification exams. So we have a catalog of uh, performance-based certification exams. And uh, I'll stop for a second to explain that. One of the things that we've heard uh, when we started these programs was a suspicion of the traditional certifications that had been out there for 10, 20 years. Uh, And it was because one of the downsides of the internet is the day after you publish a new set of multiple choice forms, the the answers and the questions are all over the internet. And the most effective way to combat that was to create live system exams. So a performance-based exam is simply an exam where you go in, you have a live system, and then you have a series of technical tasks that you have to complete during a you know a lot of amount of time while you're being monitored by by a live proctor, those exams we do sell and those cre- uh, create the revenue that we use to then funnel back into all the other outreach activities that we do. Uh, obviously, the Linux Foundation is a nonprofit, so we have the luxury of not having to you know meet Wall Street numbers uh, on a quarterly basis. But we do self fund these activities by having some paid programs as part of the mix, and we tend to congregate those programs where the skills that we are validating for people are leading them into an actual paid employment type scenario. So for instance, our Kubernetes certification exams are incredibly widely used right now, CKA, CKAD, as hiring tools for companies. Um, so yes, Aaron, you're right. We do, the money has to come from somewhere and uh, we do sell certain programs um, and that helps us create the infrastructure to be able to then plow back into creating free resources and scholarship programs and outreach programs. Because ultimately our mission is to ensure there's enough technical talent to then use all this great open source software, which the Linux Foundation is is helping to create and curate. Mm -hmm. That's great. I know that, I mean, I can only speak from experience. A lot of the folks that I work with have gone through those particular, especially the Kubernetes uh, certifications. 
Um, and so I know it's really valuable um, um, for them, you know, to have that uh, ability to go do that. So I'm glad that you have not only those programs, but also a focus, uh, you know, a dual focus or probably more than dual uh, on, you know, offering those paid programs, but then also offering the outreach and the free tools that people need to be able to, uh, um, you know, to get started, right. And to increase that diversity that we mentioned before. Um, That's exactly right. We, um, and, yeah, and, and we try to make them super affordable, right? I think that the key for us is, is the, you know, we have typically we're in this sort of $500 type range or less. And we often have promotional pricing because whether you're in India or Brazil or Europe or Canada, we want to try to make sure these programs are always accessible and affordable because our goal is to get that technical talent out into the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Where would you say the biggest areas of opportunities are if there's somebody watching or listening to this show today and they're wondering, you know, like, oh, I, I, you know, I really want to get into this area. Uh, I want to get a, a job in technology, maybe computer, uh, you know, or software engineering, rather. Um, wh- where would you suggest that they start? What are some of the hot areas? We mentioned Kubernetes, of course, but anything else that comes to mind that you would recommend folks check out? Yeah, I think the, you know, obviously Kubernetes and all things cloud native. Aaron, you were talking about with your son, the importance of DevOps and pipelines. That's just how software gets mm-hmm. built and deployed anymore. And people have to know what that is. Uh, absolutely get on GitHub or GitLab and start experimenting with repos. And even if you're not ready to code, just download some repos and look at the code and, and get a sense for how people, you know, how that um practice and how that skill set works and how it develops, um, there's always going to be need for just outright software developers, people writing code to do interesting and novel things. You know, my favorite example is when when Docker came along, you know, those LXI containers had been in Linux almost since the get-go, but nobody thought of using them in that way as a virtualization system. Uh, And so, Having that ability to go in, find interesting problems that you're passionate about and, and develop code around it, I think unlocks all kinds of opportunities for, for, uh, for folks. And of course, anything to do with web development, right? The, 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 there's the focus on whether it's a front end or back end developer. And I gave the example before of my neighborhood Chinese restaurant. Everything's now a web business. And so the, the, the need for that sort of talent to come up with great design on the front end and to be able to link that in the back end into capturing the data and um, being able to manage your uh, your user base. So obviously things like Node.js, super popular language. Um, you know, there's just, you know, the bottom line is there, there is a wide variety of career paths. When people say, you know, I want to get involved in technical, there is this huge variety from web developer front end to back end stuff to, to scalability, to security. Obviously there's a, growing importance in every sector to really think about security and privacy type issues and then just scalability right how you know what is how do you scale up infrastructure using kubernetes prometheus for d all of those types of tools and so i think the key thing is for folks to find what they're passionate about right not, not everybody's into writing code and submitting patches not everybody's into coming up with great ways to elegantly uh, break things down into microservices and package up containers but there's there's so many different opportunities there. I think if folks get involved, follow their passion to the thing that, that you know, they're, they're willing to stay up till midnight doing, they're going to find themselves on a glide path to a rewarding career, but also in almost all cases, also a very financially secure career. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to just make sure we cover our bases as well, just in case somebody's uh, coming to this discussion and, you know, knowing that you're coming to us under the Linux Foundation banner. Uh, you know, the, the, the Linux Foundation covers a lot of ground, but I'm just curious, do you, I just want to make sure it's clear to people, do you offer classes that are outside the boundaries of, you know, the, the, the projects and the things that Linux Foundation is involved with, or are all of the programs uh, just related to, Linux Foundation projects like, you know, CNCF type stuff? It, it is a good question, Aaron. We are, when we have paid programs, they, they tend to be for projects that are hosted within the Linux Foundation. But we have been more and more creating some free content 
on topics that are not hosted. A great example is last year, we launched a couple of courses on WebAssembly, which I think is a really fascinating piece of technology. Uh, obviously, it got added as the fourth official language of the web a few years ago. Uh, so we do we do venture out, especially when we see some of these technology trends that we believe are going to be important longer term. And we put those into that free catalog as part of our broader mission on exposing people to technologies that we think are going to be important, whether or not they're hosted at LF. Great. And just uh, for those that are playing along with uh, our long running drinking game, uh, do you offer any courses on blockchain? <laughs> We, we do have blockchain courses. Um, some of them are more technical. Some of them are more uh, are more conceptual. Um, we have a really successful course on blockchain essentials, which is sort of uh, for folks who want, you know, who want to understand what is a blockchain and is it more than just Bitcoin? And so, you know, separating out the cryptocurrency aspect from the um, immutable ledger aspect um, has been... Uh, something that we've invested time and energy in. And obviously, as part of the Linux Foundation, one of our big umbrella groups is called Hyperledger that hosts a whole bunch of these blockchain technologies. So you see on there, uh, Fabric, we do Sawtooth, there's just you know, Aries, uh, stuff on sovereign identity. So yes, we do have we have some really interesting free courses, and then we have some technical specific courses uh, like on Fabric, uh, which is a, um, a permissioned ledger. Uh, and... Uh, it's interesting how it goes through cycles, right? It was red hot, then not so much. And now I think there's a second wave of uh, of interest into what those distributed ledger blockchain uh, type applications can bring to bear. So I, I have a, a, a question here, which is, um, uh, and, and it has to do with the Linux Foundation in general, there are kind of two parts to this one, which is, you know, one is, it's so big and getting bigger. It's like a bigger and bigger and more important part of the uh, the overall open source world, I think, with countless companies now participating. Um, I've seen it was over half the Global 2000 are contributors to the uh, to the Linux Foundation. And it's also sort of like this United Nations of, um, of, of companies where what the Linux Foundation does is, a, I think, a really good job of getting companies to to get together and not compete on the open source stuff that they all need and that matters the most. So I'm, I'm looking for two things here. One is uh, just sort of a general take on the Linux Foundation itself and where what it is and where it's going, because I think every time we have somebody on here from the Linux Foundation, it's a little different than it was the last time. Um, and the other is, um, uh, are there actually vendors who in, in the training space that you're working with, or is this mostly in the training space um, uh, a matter that's pretty much entirely up to you and the Linux Foundation itself. So I'll, I'll take your first question first. Um, <laughs> I think you, you use a really apt analogy with the UN. I, I usually I will often use the analogy of Switzerland, which is people need a place to come collaborate and to be able to collaborate deeply and fiercely, even if they're fierce competitors out in the commercial space. And so I think the LF has really figured out how do you create that space where developers who are passionate about a project can get together and collaborate and employers who are dependent on those projects, but who compete fiercely out in the real world. Our 5G infrastructure is a great example of this, right? The telco providers are fierce competitors. But they all recognize that shared infrastructure that is global, secure, and scalable is in everybody's best interest. And so a big part of our secret source is creating the right ecosystem governance mechanisms, developer engagement mechanisms, so that projects that, that come in that have collaboration across a broad range of companies and passionate individuals and developers can gain that momentum and gain that visibility because one of the other challenges if you're a developer working on a past project that you're passionate about is you're now one of i forget what the last count is right it's well north of 10 million repos on github and so how do you gain the visibility and the traction for folks to discover that your solution is really cool and interesting and can be part of the sort of future of computing and so we do play a sort of a market making making role uh from that perspective of trying to 
rise up and create visibility for really interesting projects and at the same time recognize that great software only really becomes world-changing software if it gets adopted by governments, companies, you know, organizations that, that use it sort of out in the wild. And so that balance of bringing together the developers, bringing together the companies that have an, a vested interest, creating a fair governance model that's scalable, that's global, and a set of rules where folks feel they can engage, it has really been our secret sauce. And, and because those things are scalable, uh, it's allowed us to address the question of what well, is LF getting too large? Well, you know, LF provides a governance framework and a, and a way of organizing and scaling up projects. Uh, the individual projects do govern themselves. They have their own boards. And so the, the, the tiered structure by which we're able to take these projects and help make them successful allows it to keep scaling up because it's not this super centralized org where uh, we're at the center doing command and control, right? It's very much letting a thousand flowers bloom and creating the conditions for success for those individual projects. And to your second question, Doc, uh, yeah, I smile whenever I see a, a new entrant providing good quality training because there's no such thing as too much good training. Uh, yeah. we're, we're very happy with the reach that we have had but we're under no illusions. We're, you know, I don't think we touch 10% of the potential population that's out there. And so, you know, we bring training companies into our development process, particularly when we're thinking about certification exams. And we release our blueprints before the exam is even out. So those folks have a jump on, on creating good content for it. You know, frankly, I, I don't care if they train with us or if they train with somebody else. I just want them to, to develop those skills and to be out there using the products. Uh, in the real world, whether it's Fabric or Linux or Kubernetes or, or ONAP. Um, and we really focus our mission on entry-level talent and training and certification, but that leaves a lot of runway for intermediate and advanced skills. And again, I think a lot of these private uh, training companies or training arms of large corporate um, outfits they take up the baton really well, right? So when somebody is CKA certified on Kubernetes and they're then moving up the skill set and they're going into, you know, using OpenShift from Red Hat in a corporate use case, we want there to be on ramps, right? For people to be able to continue that education and get more specific because our focus is on familiarity with the baseline project and vendor neutral type training. But there is no such thing as a vendor neutral deployment out in the wild. You're going to have to get trained on the specific tools and infrastructure that your organization is using. And we want our material and our training to be an on-ramp for those, for those folks. And so we very much welcome having more options for training out there and look for opportunities to collaborate with folks who are doing good quality training. I want to ask one one more quick question before uh, we get into our closing ones because we're getting toward the end of the show, um, and and it's actually one that occurred to me before we even talked, and I'm just wondering whether or not it's just sort of a thought that's been in my head, which is uh, there are now so many breeds of open source that it's getting hard to generalize about them. I'm wondering if that's a topic that is close to you at all, or if it comes up, or do you think it's open source is still a kind of a unified enough concept that we can still generalize about it? Yeah, I think it's the latter. You know, if if the you know, I, I like Linus's quote that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. If, if you can see the source code, it's open source. And I mean, you know, there's a ton of licenses and there's a lot of nuance. So I don't want to gloss that over. But fundamentally, if everybody can see the code and anybody can contribute to the code, that's the power of open source, right? Is we don't care if you're in Botswana or if you're the most senior Facebook engineer, if you have something to contribute that makes a project more useful, you should have the opportunity to do that and then have others benefit from that work. Uh, and I think if you, so if you pull up to that level of saying where does open source add value, that still remains true, right? It's open, the code's there, you can contribute, you can pull it down, you can fork it if you decide to. Uh, yes, there's a lot of complexity beneath that as to which type of license you're trying to use, for instance. But fundamentally, if it's open and it's available, that's the key that unlocks the potential of all those millions of developers who are out there 
working on, you know, what turns into Linux or what turns into Git or what turns into, you know, Docker containers. Yeah, it, it strikes me that um, this is an aspect of uh, what we used to call GandhiCon 4. I didn't remember the first three, except that it's something like, first they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> and it's it's sort of, then we won. Open source has become so mainstream, it's almost impossible to avoid it. So we always close with uh, with four quick questions, one of which Aaron already brought up, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up anyway. Um, if you have anything in particular to say about blockchain, you brought up... Um, Hyperledger, I thought, and we've actually had Brian Bellendorf on the show before. If you have anything more to say about blockchain, that would be cool. <laughs> if not, it's a... Uh, you know, it, 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 it is a technology, it, it, it's a technology that's still very much at the front end of demonstrating what's possible to do. I think the some of the things that people have seen early on, for instance, supply chains, for folks who've been paying attention, I think they understand those use cases very, very well. Uh, some of the newer applications, uh, the, the one I find most interesting is the sovereign identity and the fact that you can control your personal information. And, you know, the great example Brian uses is you walk into a bar and you show them your driver's license. Well, that's got your height, your weight, your address. All they needed to know was you were over 21, right? And so how can I shard my identity? Because if Doc needs to know I'm over 21, that's all, it's a yes, no question. I don't need to show all my personal information. And so some of those technologies that are based on the idea of immutable ledgers around sovereign identity, I think are gonna become incredibly important over the next five years because people now know that these are things that you really, really need to be concerned about is how, you know, how much control you have over your personal information. And there's something about the ability of blockchains and distributed ledgers to hold that information and yet still let you have control over it that I think is going to be incredibly powerful. You know, it's funny because I, I didn't know I was setting you up for promoting the very thing that I work on, which is the, <laughs> the self-sovereign identity. It's a, it's actually in our family here. My wife is very involved in the Sovereign Foundation early in its, uh, in its history. <laughs> I even helped bring it to Hyperledger. So uh, it's close. So the... Uh, um, one quick one. Is there any question we haven't asked that you'd like that we had that we would, and then have two more quick ones after that? You know, um, I think th there's a variant of it, and people ask me sometimes, you know, what, what, how do I get started? And the answer is just start. Grab a free course and just start. If, if it's not your thing, it was free anyway, so just drop it and move on to something else. But, you know, don't wait for the great omen in the sky. Just pick something and start on it. Uh, the, the only way to start is to start. And so that's the advice I give folks when who are thinking about a career and they're trying to figure out, well, what's the right way to go about it? And the answer is, there's no right way. Pick something. If it turns out to be what you're interested in, that's great. Go deep. If it turns out that it's not, as soon as you decide it's not, move on, go pick something else. But uh, just, you know, who, who's the... Uh, the slogan of just, just do it. That's why I tell folks, just, just do it. It's funny. I, I, I was a visiting scholar at, uh, at, at journalism at a graduate school at NYU in New York. And, uh, um, and Clay Shirky was teaching this class. And and these are graduate school students in journalism. They're learning about reporting and all that. And he comes in and he says, okay, we're, we have to do a deal with data. We're all going to learn JavaScript now. And then, taught the class JavaScript. Uh, he brought in somebody to help with that and like two or three, two or three classes and it was over. Everybody could do, you know, enough JavaScript to do their jobs better. So that seems to me like that's part of it too. There, there are people who are not necessarily going to be professional coders, but they're going to need to know some code in order to operate in whatever professional environment they're in. Because as you pointed out, we live in a webbed world now. We, you know, we're all technical, whether we like it or not. And that's sort of an interesting situation to be in. Um, what, so two last ones. One is, um, what are your, what is your favorite, uh, scripting language? And, uh, um, and what's the other one, Aaron, quickly, <laughs> like, like the thing disappeared. Uh, oh, yeah, text your, editor, text, text editor, editor, text editor yeah. and scripting. Yeah. I had it up here to remind myself. <laughs> that. 
That's what we have to I would tell you what my favorite text editor is, but you know, I can already see the pitchforks and talks. Oh, there, so. there are pitchforks for all of them. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Equal opportunity uh, uh, pitchforks. <laughs> that's right. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to plead the fifth on those. Uh, we, we love all open source projects. Equally. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the first one to plead the fifth, actually. Well, it has been it has been fantastic having you on the show. This is a really great window into what you're doing, and uh, we hope you'll be back. and uh, And we really appreciate your your. Thanks being for here. having me. It's it, that, you know, as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. I think it's important and it's <laughs> yeah. endlessly fascinating. And you do a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Aaron, how's that? <laughs> that go for you <laughs> yeah it, you know this is actually a subject that's uh near and dear to my heart in terms of education in general right i mean i think that especially in the open source space uh it can seem daunting for people to to get their feet wet right i i can easily see someone like saying okay i want to learn this stuff and then they land on a github page and they're immediately lost and confused and, and not sure where to go and maybe they give up in frustration um or they end up in a room at a conference somewhere and it's full of dudes, right? <laughs> so again, frustrating, uh, you know, to, to be in a room where people don't look like you. So I, I, I applaud the, the efforts that they're making. I think it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. very much needed. And, uh, you know, people can really benefit from, from learning about open source and these open source projects and languages and tools and everything. Yeah, and I love the way... Um uh, uh, the Linux Foundation jumps in front of a topic that's a really important one, and they did with this. But I want to change the subject and say for a moment that I want to speak for the entire audience in saying, you do not look old enough to have a kid at Cornell. I'm sorry, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very you much. Pull that I appreciate one off. That's that. not a green screen trick that you've got. They actually managed. <laughs> yep. <I> mean, <laughs> very good. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, that's like, I'll take that compliment all day long. <laughs> I'm old enough to have grandkids there, but <laughs> not, there, not quite yet. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so um, so so, give us your plugs. What are what what are what are you? I know you've got some stuff you want to you're working on. Now. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to keep the dog from barking. I think she hears is the. That, is uh, that your dog? Truck. I don't know if that was. Yeah. If, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there she goes. Dog. There's not my dog. There she goes. I'll, I'll try to get. I'll shut the door and try to get the plugs in. <laughs> um, let so, me just say yeah, for so a moment the, that, that dogs, dogs only bark for two reasons. One is there's something going on. The other is there's nothing going on. So <laughs> there, there you go. Oh, she's great, but she does get, a, she, she's a, a golden retriever. And as she gets older, she gets more frightened easily, it seems like. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so let me first thank my employer, Sysdig, for letting me come on here. Uh, open source is in the foundation of what Sysdig does. So I just want to thank them for letting me take a few, a little bit of uh, time out of my busy startup uh, work day to, to come on and talk because it's uh, sometimes difficult to do that. Um, and then also, if folks are interested, they can check out my YouTube channel called the Retro Hack Shack, um, yeah, where I discuss, you know, old technology, uh, fix broken computers, dress up like I was in the 70s. Uh, which is a lot of fun. That was my uh, my recent video where I actually built an Apple One from scratch. So as kind of a workshop, a tutorial. So if you ever wanted to build an Apple One, I take you through the entire process in about an hour. And uh, by the end of it, I did have a functioning Apple wow. One. So it was You channel your inner was. You become was That's right. for a day. <laughs> That's right. I did a history. I'd actually did a history one before that, which was my most successful video to date. It's all, almost uh, 20,000 views in a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, people are really interested in in the early history. I, it feels like anyway, to me, of computing and personal computing and, and all of that. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested, check out the channel. Yeah, it, it's important to it's important to know that stuff because. It was about us acting as as fully sovereign, self sovereign individuals, which is what uh, Clyde brought up earlier, and a big part of where blockchain, what blockchain is about, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, too. Just to matters. bring it all together, just back into the topic of this episode, is it's a great way to learn. 
you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so not only can you go out and take a course, but you can go purchase a, one of these old computers that are much simpler to understand the inner workings and how the memory relates to the processor and all this kind of stuff. It's a lot simpler to understand with the older right. technology. Yeah. So go, go yeah, get a, go get an view. Apple one yeah. or a Commodore 64 and see, understand how it works. And then you'll, you'll, you'll learn it, you know, by extension, you'll learn kind of how things developed and how they work today. So uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend it to anybody that's into technology and just wants to learn how it works. And it's amazing how much they could get out of like 48K or 64K or whatever it was. You know, I, mean, I could tell. I mean, I tried to go, I tried, oh, totally. I tried to go back and, and, and recreate a game in Python that was written in assembly and forget it. I, I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. get it to work. There was, it's like, wait a second. That was like 40 years ago they were doing this. Why can't I get this to work on modern technology with modern languages? And we could go into a whole discussion of why that is, but. <laughs> and an assembly uh, could actually be fast on that old iron. Assembly was super amazing. fast, of course. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. <laughs> Well, this has been great. So thanks a lot, Aaron. And, uh, and, and thanks everybody. Um, uh, it's been a great show. I'm Doc Searles. We'll see you next week on another Floss Weekly. Oh, let's plug the show. Oh, oh yeah. Plug next week's show. Sorry, everybody. I have to, I'd have to switch over to schedule here. I have to move a window. Guy Martin. And he is, forgive me. Uh, okay. Hang on a second. Schedule. Guy Martin, I have to scroll down. Uh, Oasis. This was me. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I do this all the time. I know. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. So thanks again, everybody. This has been a great show. Uh, come back next week when Guy Martin of Oasis will be with us. We'll talk about standards. We'll talk about much more that's coming up next week. You know what's fun? Android. You know what's even more fun, though? All about Android. That's my show, Jason Howell, along with my co-hosts, Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and we welcome guests on each and every week from throughout the Android ecosystem, developers, Googlers, journalists, people who are all geeked out about the Android operating system. We tell you everything you need to know. Twit.tv slash AAA every Tuesday. We'll see you there. <laughs>